Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Levi's Kitchen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is not a... Uh, it just so happens the place that I've found that it's easiest for me to record videos is while I'm making my shake or cooking my breakfast in my, in my kitchen. So, actually my second wife bought me this towel. It says Levi's Kitchen right here. I don't know if you can see that. Levi's Kitchen. I've had this thing since probably 2012, 2013. So it just gave me the idea to start calling these vlogs when I'm in the kitchen. Levi's Kitchen. Hola, como estas? Namaste. Assalamu alaikum. Privet. Niao. Niao ma. That's all I can remember right now. I hope everybody's well. So today, I'm about to make my shake this morning. I wanted to talk about several people keep asking me to um, post some more motivational videos, so I figured that's what I would do. Where's the camera on this thing? Over here? Yeah, okay. So I've, this is going to be a little bit of a, I don't even know if it's a motivational video, just a um, awareness video. Because I know times when I've, there are times growing up, coming through my life, I'm 40 now, where I have felt down in the dumps or whatever, and everybody gets down in the dumps sometimes, and some of us have a harder, diff, more difficult time picking ourselves back up. And one of the things that always made it more difficult for me was always feeling like something was wrong with me. You know, why, why was I so depressed? You know, something must be, not, you know, depressed, whatever the issue was at the time anxiety, depression, whatever it happened to be, um, you know, something was wrong with me because you're not aware of what's going on in other people's minds. But what I've come to realize now at 40 is that everyone goes through that stuff. Everyone. Joe Rogan <clears throat> has, um, one of his podcasts said, uh, the days where he feels depressed and sad and bummed out and does not feel like doing what he needs to do and going to work and getting out of bed and living his day are far more numerous than the days when he feels well and actually feels like going out and doing what he needs to do. And, you know, I think I can agree with that. <clears throat> I can agree with that. So I was just going to talk a little bit about some of the experiences I've had. And hopefully that can help some of you all. So, you know, throughout my life, I've been uh, basically not lying, but trying to force myself to be someone I was not, but, but not even being aware that I was doing that, not even realizing that I was trying to be someone I was not. Um, I got, you know, do, forcing my things to do things that... Well, then there were some times when I was aware, like um, forcing myself to do things that I was that never even enjoyed doing, never wanted to do. And when I was a kid, ever since growing up, I've, I've always been very aware of how things affect my body, what's healthy for me, what's good for me, what's not good for me. All the way back, as far as I can remember, my dad used to love drinking soda. My dad loved Pepsi, loved Pepsi. And uh, I was never interested. I never wanted to drink soda because I heard at some point in my childhood, I heard that caffeine is addictive. And now I'm 40 and I drink coffee and, and I don't know if... And actually when I was in the army and when I deployed, I drank a lot of energy drinks and things like that because when you're at war, you do what you gotta do. I mean, you take the risk you gotta take. You wanna stay alive. <clears throat> you wanna come home to your family, but... I, uh... I never wanted to be addicted to anything, no matter what. And now I'm older and I don't know if it's something that I developed or if it's something that I was gifted with, but <clears throat> I've, I actually do not get addicted to things. Um, I don't. I smoked cigarettes for when I started when I was 18, smoked until my wife got pregnant with my first son, so three years, and when I, when, when I decided to quit, I quit. And it was stupid of me to ever start. I smoked cigarettes to fit in. Um, I also, you know, there was a time in my life when I was, this is after my second wife left me, um, I was so down in the dumps and I was in the army, and you know, 
I love all my army brothers and sisters, but the culture of the military is alcoholism. I mean, the culture of the United States is alcoholism. <clears throat> Honestly, I'm just gonna be honest. <clears throat> and I was never, I never wanted to be an alcoholic. Like I said, I didn't even drink soda because I didn't want to be addicted. I never want to put poison in my body. And I never want to do drugs. I never want to smoke. I never want to do any of those things. But it got to the point where I became so desperate to fit in. I just wanted to, two marriages had failed. And I wanted to, I wanted to feel like I belonged, right? I mean, not everybody wants to feel like they belong. And I got to a point where, at one point, I uh, I started drinking a lot. I actually made my, my my second wife came to me one day a couple months before she left me and told me she had come to an adult decision. She had weighed the pros and the cons, weighed the good and the bad, weighed the risk and the reverse the reward, and decided she wanted to be an alcoholic. This is actually a conversation she sat down to have with me. And it blew my mind at the time, but I I honestly uh, I mean I obviously I. Uh, did not go along with that, and a few months later, she um, went to work one day and never came home. So after she left me, and all my military friends are alcoholics, I started to feel like, well, maybe it's me, maybe I'm a prude, maybe I need to be an alcoholic, you know, maybe. Obviously, it's not as bad as what I think it is, because everyone's an alcoholic. So I decided to start drinking a lot and going out partying and everything. And um, I drank what I call a lot, you know, one or two weekends a month, one or two days a month. But when I drank, I, I got embarrassingly drunk. But I thought that was what I needed to do. I thought that was what I was supposed to do to make friends. And then <clears throat> in one situation, I actually was hanging out with uh, one of my best friends. And this is me as a 36, 37-year-old man. You know, it's pretty embarrassing, but uh, it happened. And uh, I got drunk every single day for about a month straight. Woke up in the morning, started drinking, drank until I went to sleep. Woke up in the morning, started drinking again. And then after roughly 30 days, I got my head out of my butt. And I realized, I don't care if this is what I have to, if this is what I have to do to, to make friends and to fit in, then I'm just not going to make friends and I'm not going to fit in. And I just quit. I just stopped. I drank every single day hard liquor for 30 days from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep. And then I stopped because I didn't want to. And that's, that's the key to addiction. All right? <clears throat> that's the key to anything. That's the key to any success at anything. You're only going to do what you want to do. You're only going to do what is a priority to you. If, you, if it's not a priority for you to stop smoking crack or doing meth, if it is not the most important thing in the world to you, you're not going to do it. If, if you're dealing with something mentally that's causing, that you're trying to hide from, that you're hiding behind alcohol and drugs, you've got to deal with that thing that's, that's driving you to that place. But if, if you're not going to deal with that, you're not going to be able to get over your addictions. And for me, just luckily... I've always, even since I was a kid, I've always been willing to look inside myself and be vulnerable with myself and open to others. And I've always been willing to point out those inefficiencies in myself and work on them. <clears throat> I've done some stupid drugs in my life, addictive drugs, and when I didn't, I stopped. I didn't want to do them. so. Drugs that people say you do it once, you're addicted for life. I don't do them. And it's been 20 years, and I have no intention of ever doing them again. And it was stupid of me to try them once, but I was a weak-minded person for a long time, and, and I made those mistakes, and I've learned from those mistakes. You know, I never... <laughs> I never learned, there's a lot of things that your parents are supposed to teach you about self-esteem and emotional maturity that I never, my parents never taught me because they couldn't teach me because no one ever taught them. And there's a lot of parents out there, a lot of you watching this video, 
your parents probably love you. Most likely, your parents love you. There are some parents out there that are dirtbags and don't love their kids, but most parents love their kids. Even parents that abuse their children physically and mentally, most of them love their kids in, emotionally. Most of them care about their kids. They just don't know how to be a good parent. Like, like David Goggins, I've read recently read David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt Me, and I'm, and I'm going to actually do some uh, reviews or some, not reviews, but summary of that book because we have a lot of things in common, David Goggins and I, but we also have a lot of things that are different. And the main focus of my life since, since childhood, the most important thing in the world to me has been love and honor and compassion. And um, I think David Goggins still isn't there. But as far as his mental st strength and his emotional stability, I, he's way ahead of me. So everybody is behind in some of their development and ahead in other parts of their development. But, uh, so, <clears throat> I was told repeatedly growing up by my parents, I was told repeatedly that I was a bum, a punk, lazy, that I was never going to be anything. Uh, my mother always thought it was funny. My mother thinks, my, both of my parents are bullies. Both of my parents are bullies. But they're not bad people. They're bullies because they are insecure. They, people are extremely insecure about themselves and how they compensate with that for that. Even bullies at school, even cyber bullies, even Donald Trump. How they compensate is making themselves feel like someone else is inferior to them. That's what makes them feel better. That's what racism is all about. That's what slavery is all about. That's what any kind of hate is all about. That's what the mistreatment of the LGBTQ community is all about. It's about other people's insecurities and they want someone to, to, that they can feel superior to because then they don't have to look at themselves for some reason. Then that makes them feel like they don't have to look inside themselves to become aware of their own insecurities and what they need to work on because they can look at someone else and say, oh, well, your skin's black, so I'm better than you, so I don't have to fix my problems because at least my skin's not black. Or you're gay, at least I'm not gay, so I don't have to fix my problems because I'm way better than you, you're gay. Or, or you know, you, you had a transgender, you had, you know, whatever the stupid, ignorant thing is that they are using to justify their own behavior, that's what it's all about. They're insecure. There's something they don't like about themselves. And rather than addressing that about themselves, they would rather point out the differences of other people to make them feel better. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book by Dr. Seuss called the, I think it's called the Sneetches. It might be called the Star, the Star Belly Sneetches. But that's a good book you might want to read. The book starts out, with two factions of these creatures created by Dr. Seuss. You know how crazy his creatures are. Some of them have stars on their bellies and some of them don't. You got the star belly sneeches and the sneeches with no stars. So the star belly sneeches treat the sneeches with no stars like dirt because they're, the star belly sneeches are insecure. And the sneeches with no stars on their belly are insecure as well because they don't have stars on their belly. <clears throat> so they invent a machine that puts stars in their bellies. So now all the Sneetches have stars in their bellies. Well, the insecure Sneetches don't like that because now they can't, they don't have anyone to persecute. So what do the star belly Sneetches do? The same guy that created the machine that puts a star on your belly created another machine that removes a star from your belly. So now the star belly Sneetches who were persecuting the non-star belly sneeches, they go and get their stars removed. So you should check that out. It's a children's book, but it, it's a very meaningful book. So, so I grew up with my parents not being able to teach me emotional maturity or emotional stability because they didn't have it, and they still don't have it, and they're in their 60s, and they still are very emotionally immature and insecure with themselves. They love me very much. I love them very much. 
but they have a lot of issues that they're not willing to address, which is most people, and I, I never knew that. Till recently, I always thought when somebody learned something, because I always did, if I learned something that was <clears throat> beneficial to me, whether I liked it or not, I implemented it into my life. But I never realized that most people don't do that. I don't know if it's laziness or if it's an inability for their brains to... I don't know. All I know is I can. And I do. So I grew up thinking, <coughs> believing, I became an adult, <coughs> believing that I was a lazy bum and a punk and that I was worthless and never going to be anything. And like I was going to say, my mother thinks that sarcasm is... is the greatest thing in the world, but what it really is is bullying. It makes her feel better about herself. Now, whenever I was singing, I would always, you know, it was every time I would sing, it was always good. Lord, it sounds like you're killing a cat in there. Da da da. Then I grew up a little bit and found out people love listening to me sing. I'm I'm a good singer. I sing well, or that's what people say, anyways. <laughs> Maybe they're just being nice. So I grew up. <clears throat> I never believed in myself. I never understood life. I pursued abusive relationships because I didn't even know I was being abused. <clears throat> my entire childhood, I was abused. But I didn't know I was abused because that was just normal life for me, which it is to everyone who's abused. When you grow up in an abusive home, David Goggins was abused by his father. Luckily, his, from his stories, his mother was not abusive. She was supportive, so he had someone there to teach him how to be strong, but I didn't. Both my parents were abusive. My mother was extremely abusive, and my dad was never home, and when he was home, it didn't matter what my mom said. He was going to enforce it. So if my mom said the moon was purple, the, the moon was purple, and if you didn't agree with it, you're going to get the sh crap knocked out of you. I wasn't allowed to ask questions. If I asked my parents a question, here's the two responses. My mom would make something up, like, like Adam Sandler's mom in The Water Boy, <clears throat> you know, Alligators are so angry, be so ornery because they don't. They got all them teeth and no toothbrush. That's what my mom would do. My mom would just tell me the most. She just still does it. Like I'm not learning anything. Why can't you just say I don't know? Why can't you just say I'm not sure, son? Go read a book. And my father, if I asked him a question, the answer was Z. First, it started out. If I asked him why, if he said something and I didn't understand it, and I asked him why, why, Dad? Z. The answer would be Z. Why, Dad? Z. If I asked more than once, I got smacked upside the head. So then I learned not to ask questions. Then it got to the point where I didn't have to ask why. It didn't matter what my question was. I could ask him the square root of 27 or how far the sun was from the, from the earth or what 2 plus 2 was, you know, and the answer was Z. I wasn't allowed to ask questions. Uh, my father questions. My mama asked her questions. I got the wrong answer, which I grew up believing was the right answer. Until I was in my 20s and 30s and realized, oh, 90% of everything my mother taught me was wrong. But I think a lot of people probably have that realization, especially people who grow up in religious homes. We grow up and we realize, unless we stay in the small town and in the religion, we realize a lot of what our parents told us was wrong. So, and again, my parents love me and I love my parents very much. So I carried all these inefficiencies throughout my life. I never even heard of self-discipline until a few years ago. Uh, I never heard of personal boundaries. I had no clue what personal boundaries were until a couple years ago. <clears throat> you know, probably 2017. And when I had like my fourth adult relationship, uh, which turned out to not be a relationship, just another person using me. And... Um, that's when I learned about boundaries. And I also learned that people who grow up in abusive homes often have no, no idea what boundaries are. So here I am at 40 years old, finally learning boundaries. Um, looking back, you know, I treated people badly because I was forcing myself to be around people that I never should have been around. And the reason is because I had never heard of boundaries and, and I never had any boundaries because my parents taught me that if you love someone, <clears throat> you let them treat you however they treat you. And, uh, you know, what's it called? Um, 
unconditional love means no matter how horrible someone is to you, you love them anyway. <clears throat> and you just keep putting up with it. And what that makes is you miserable. That ruins your life. You can't think. You, you can't be you. You can't do anything. You become a hermit or a scared person walking around on eggshells because you never want to because someone's treating you like crap and you think that in order to love them you have to just continue to allow them to treat you like crap and that's how your life goes on they treat you like crap you let them treat you like crap you feel worse about yourself they treat you like crap you let them treat you like crap you feel even worse about yourself they treat you like it just keeps it's just a circle that keeps going on and on and it never ends it never ends until you break free I always felt inadequate. I never felt like I was good enough for anyone or anything. Um, I thought I deserved to be treated badly, except for I didn't even realize I was being treated badly. I thought I was being treated normal. Like, now I know I was being treated terrible and I was allowing people to treat me terrible because that was the way I'd been taught. But I never even realized, I never knew. I knew it made me feel like crap. I knew it made me feel horrible. My first wife treated me like garbage and I just did what I had always learned to do. I just took it and felt horrible about myself. Oh, I spent my whole life trying to prove myself to everyone and, and to myself because I never knew who I was. I never knew who I was because when someone's constantly put beating you down, when you're constantly being beat down, or when you, when you believe that love is sacrificing your own desire, yourself, your own needs, that just constantly giving for other people, when you believe that, and then you just, you're so concerned with putting other people first, and you have no concern for yourself, so you're putting other people first, and then you're letting them treat you like garbage, you, you, you never have any clue who you are. Never. And I never did. I never did. I always blamed myself for the way other people treated me because of what I was saying about <clears throat> unconditional love. You know, I thought, and I also always learned that you don't point fingers. Like I said, I, when I learn something that is beneficial to me, I implement it. I put it into action in my life. So when I learned that... And I learned that you don't make excuses. You don't make excuses for what the things you've done, for your mistakes, for, for everything. You don't make excuses. You take responsibility for your actions and for your words. I implemented that. I've always done that. When I screw up, I take responsibility. I never blame other people. So when somebody was treating me like garbage, I blame myself. Because I didn't blame them. I didn't know that person is bullying me because they are insecure with themselves and bullying me makes them feel superior. I just thought, I'm no good. I'm no good and this person's pointing that out to me and I just have to take responsibility for being no good and continue to put this person first and be selfless and uh, this is how I went through life for 38 years. But you still you still have to face life and keep moving forward. And all these explanations for all the reasons that I was weak are um, just obstacles to overcome. And this is also something that David Goggins talks about that I agree with him about. Um, you know, they're not excuses to hide behind to give up. They're challenges in your life to overcome to make you stronger. And when you over, when you fix, when you, everyone, nobody's perfect, right? We all can agree on that. Nobody's perfect. And that's another, some people, want. <sighs> insecure people can't even say that. A lot of insecure people can't even acknowledge that they're not perfect. I told my parents one time that they weren't perfect, and this is in my 30s, and they lost their minds. I hurt their feelings. I offended them so bad. It, it was insane. I, I, I was just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> you have to be able to look at yourself and see your weaknesses and see your faults and be able to single those things out and think to myself, okay, I don't like this about myself. How can I think if I change that about myself, 
I'll be a better person. I'll be closer to that person I want to be. So how can I improve that? What, what do I need to do to improve that? What are the steps that I need to take in order to accomplish that goal, goal that gives me the ability to improve that weakness? Like me, I just constantly learn. I've always constantly learned. <clears throat> Never stop learning, I'm, thank God. And I've always just wanted to learn and learn and learn and learn. And finally, at 37, 38 years old, I finally hit the jackpot and realized, oh my gosh, a giant problem for me is that I have never even heard of self-discipline or personal boundaries. And if I start using self-discipline and I start enforcing personal boundaries, first of all, self-discipline is going to help me to build self-confidence and self-esteem. And enforcing my personal boundaries, first I had to develop my personal boundaries, what are my boundaries, but enforcing those personal boundaries gives me the ability to be able to say, okay, I don't want this person in my life because this person violates my boundaries. If I have this person in my life, I'm constantly going to feel negatively. That's constant negative energy from that person. That is what a toxic person is. If the toxic person isn't a bad person. Someone who violates your boundaries is not a bad person. They are just not good for you. Um, a toxic person is, a, is where you're, someone's violating your boundaries and you're letting them know they're violating your boundaries and they just continue to violate your boundaries. They show no respect for you or your boundaries. That person has to be removed from your life. You will never be able to grow. You'll never be able to reach your full potential if you continue to surround yourself with people that disregard your boundaries. So, I always blame myself for, you know, the way I was treated. I never realized what I've been saying, that the way other people are treating me, the way abusive people are treating you, has absolutely nothing to do with you. It has to do with them and their insecurities. And you need to be able to tell yourself that. You need to be able to realize, there, this isn't what I deserve. I don't deserve to be treated this way. Like, whatever it is, that, that thing that's making you feel bad, it could be different for you, different for me. There are some universal things that, you know, telling someone constantly, let's just say someone's constantly telling you you're a loser, someone you love, someone who's supposed to love you and build you up and support you is constantly telling you you're no good loser. You have to be able to recognize that you are not a loser and that has absolutely nothing to do with you they are projecting themselves onto you. They are so insecure about themselves, they need to be able to make you feel bad so that they can feel better about themselves. And if that is your parents or your brothers and sister or your wife or husband, you need to try to have a conversation with them to let them know that they have to stop treating you like that. And if they will not, that is your boundary. You are letting them know what your boundary is, that they cannot continue to say those things to you because it is messing up your headspace even if you think it's not messing up your headspace it is you don't need that in your life you don't want that in your life and if those people whoever it is won't respect your boundary you need to remove that person from your life unfortunately i have removed both my parents from my life recently i love my parents very much they are toxic to me and because of that one of my brothers has removed me from his life and that's i just have to accept that in order to be the man that I want to be, I can't constantly be poisoning myself with that negative energy. I love them very much and I wish them nothing but the best. I've informed them of my boundaries several times over the past few years. They continued to ignore them and it got to the point where it had to stop. It got to the point where they were the most negative influence in my life and I had to remove that. And you might have to do that also. Some, you might have to remove your husband or your wife or your parents. You still have to keep moving forward. Like I said, I'm 40 years old now and I'm just now I'm learning these things. I just started really making these major steps in my um, <clears throat> emotional maturity and my psychological uh, awareness. Emotional awareness and psychological awareness since, since I was about 37. All right, so the first 37 years of my life, I was lost. I was constantly trying to fit in, 
trying to prove my self-worth to other people, trying to prove my self-worth to myself. I had no self-confidence, no self-esteem, no idea what boundaries were, no idea what self-discipline was. I was a victim. I was a victim. I thought life was happening to me. I did not realize I had any control over my life. Life doesn't happen to you. Well, maybe life does happen to you. But the thing is, the part that matters is how you react to it. How you perceive it. Something bad happens. You can't say, oh gosh, that terrible thing happened. Oh, you know, everything's just going to be terrible. For You know, everything, it's always, my life's always terrible. I not, all this stuff always happens to me. No, you can't do that. You're telling yourself that. You're telling yourself that. You're convincing yourself that your life is terrible and that everything's always going to be terrible. You cannot do that. You have to see it as one incident. Even if every day for two years you have a negative thing, you have to keep th seeing those as one incident. Your life is not negative. Your life is however you believe it is. Believe your life is happy. Believe you are special. Believe you're special. You are. Who's going to tell you you're not? If somebody tells you you're not special, guess what? That's a toxic person. Remove them. You don't need that. Why would you spend your life not believing you're great? Every, you can live, however, you're going to live your whole entire life until you die. Why would you spend your life believing you're worthless and keeping negative influences around you and keeping toxic people around you when you could spend your life believing you're special and keeping positive people around you and keeping positive influences around you? It's your choice. It is your choice. You can make that choice. It might hurt. It, you think it hurt to tell my parents that I can't have them in my life anymore. That hurt. It still hurts. It's only been about two weeks. It hurts. But I know it's best for me. I know that I was being held back with that constant negative influence. And you're going to have to make that choice one day. Maybe today. Maybe you're going to have to make that choice multiple times. Over the last two or three years, I removed several of my friends first. My parents were last. Like my, I kept giving them chances. I kept talking to them about my boundaries. I kept trying to sh tell them, this is what's going to happen. I need you to respect my boundaries. Two years, three years. And over the course of those two or three years, I was removing my f friends who I thought were friends, but they weren't. They were toxic influences on my life. But I never realized that before. So, like I was saying about if you let people continually abuse you. I've had two marriages and two divorces. Um, I completely lost myself in both marriages because I never had any boundaries. I let people treat me however they treated me. You ever hear that saying, we teach people how to treat us? It's very true. The thing is, you don't teach people how to treat you. You teach people how they can't treat you. And the only way you can teach them that is to let them know a couple times, you can't do that to me, like, like me, throughout my life. I hate lying. I hate liars. I never freaking lie. I've probably made them, you know, lied two or three times in my life since, since I was 14 years old. Two or three times where I've made a mistake and lied. And, uh... I can't remember what those lies were, but they were stupid. I should never lie. You should never, ever lie. Ever. I don't care what the reason is. Don't lie. So back to the lying thing. <clears throat> I have always told people, women, men too probably, don't lie to me. If you lie to me the first time you lie to me, I'm removing you from my life. That was a boundary that I had actually, but I never knew it was a boundary. And the fact that I didn't know what boundaries were created the issue I'm about to tell you. People would lie to me. And I'd get upset about it and I'd forgive them. And then, even though I already told them, if you lie to me, you're out of my life. They'd lie to me. It would crush me. I'd forgive them. They'd lie to me again. It would crush me again. I'd forgive them. They'd lie to me again. And it would just keep going on and on and on and on. And they'd lie to me and lie to me and lie to me until eventually they had manipulated and used me to the full extent of their 
benefit to, to where they felt like they couldn't get anything else from me and then they'd, they'd excuse themselves from my life. So, and then, so I would spend months, years, sacrificing my own boundaries and my own humanity and my own mental space for them and then they would betray me. And I never understood that. I never understood that. The way you teach people to treat you is when I say, if you lie to me, you're out of my life, and then they lie to me, they're out of my life. The way you teach people to treat you, you can't teach people to treat you by forgiving them. You can't. They won't. No one will ever learn that way. They won't. Unfortunately, it's just not how people work. And this has been a hard, hard lesson for me because <clears throat> since I was a kid, I've always been about love and compassion and forgiveness. And unfortunately, most people are not like that. Most people will not do the right thing. Most people will take and take and take. As long as you're willing to give, they are willing to take. And they have no intention of ever giving back. And they won't ever change their behavior if you just continue to allow them to behave negatively. So let's say for me it was the line. And now I have several more boundaries now that I know what they are. But when someone, when I say if you lie to me, you're out of my life because I can never trust you if you're a liar. And somebody lies to me, they're out of my life. That's it. I'll meet new people. And the only way I'm going to meet the types of people that aren't going to lie to me, the only way I'm going to meet the types of people that are a positive influence on my life is if I remove the people that are a negative influence on my life. There's only so many people you can fit in your life. You can only have, be close to so many people. And if all your closest people are abusing you and you're allowing it, first of all, the good people that you want in your life, and I'm just calling them good for you, aren't going to try to squeeze in because they're going to see, okay, yeah, that I don't want to be part of that, all that negativity. They're going to see all those negative people around you, and they're not going to want to be part of it. They're not going to volunteer to go over there and be abused with you. And second of all, <clears throat> when you introduce yourself to that person, when you do meet that person, they're going to know who you surround yourself with, so they're going to assume that you're like them. So they're not going to want you in their life. So the only way you can grow, the only way you can teach people how to treat you is to remove them from your life. And that's it. And you don't go chasing them, trying to get them back. Once they violate your boundaries, that's it. Get them out of your life. Maybe forgive them once if, if you want. I don't anymore. Another one of my boundaries, and I don't argue anymore. I have no time. I don't want any negative energy in my life. Somebody wants to argue all the time, I'll tell them once, maybe twice. I don't want to argue. I have no interest in arguing about anything, nothing, with anyone. If it's not worth dying for, it's not worth arguing about. That's my rule now. And if people want to keep arguing with me, I remove them from my life. It's that simple. I don't want to argue. I don't want negative energy. If you're going to perpetuate negative energy into my life, you're not going to be part of my life. And you need to have that same rule. You need to figure out what is negative energy for you. Some people love arguing. My ex-wife loves arguing. That's one <clears throat> reason why we didn't... One reason why we didn't have a successful marriage. I hate arguing. I have absolutely no interest in arguing. It is nothing but negative energy to me. you got to find out what your boundaries are and enforce them. And the way you teach people how to treat you is when they ignore your boundaries, you remove them from your life, and then they have to decide <clears throat> whether or not they want to continue treating people that way. And if they do, they can go find someone else to treat that way. If they come, want to come back into your life, you have to make that decision of whether or not you're going to give them an opportunity to prove that they've changed. In the meantime, other people who, in my case, also despise arguing also despise lying are going to see me and see that I demand honesty and that I demand kindness and they're going to gravitate towards me because that's what they also value and the same thing for you when you define your boundaries and enforce them 
similar people to you are going to gravitate towards you. And that's how you treat people to teach how to teach people how to treat you. So, yeah, like I said, most people aren't going to just voluntarily do the right thing. Me, this has been a hard, difficult lesson. Like I said, I've always, always tried to do the right thing. And, uh, most people don't. It's what I've had to learn. Most people don't. Most people do whatever benefits them in that moment. And in, and in that moment, whatever benefits them, in the next moment, the opposite might benefit them. And they're just quick to flick the switch, boom, and do the opposite. You might be benefiting them right now, and in five seconds you're not anymore, and that guy is, boom, you're, you're, you're a waste to them now. They're on to that guy or that girl or whatever. If you give people the opportunity to manipulate and take advantage of you, they will. And this is just the reality. It's just the facts of life. It's unfortunate. And <clears throat> I've spent my entire life in the United States. I've traveled a little bit outside the country, and especially with the Army. So I really can't speak much for other countries. I assume Asian countries are different. I assume South and Latina countries are different, but I don't really know. I know that they're a lot more focused on community and family and fairness, but I don't know. So most of what I'm saying is people in the United States, maybe we have created this society. Maybe this is the culture we have created. Uh, after 40 years of always doing the right thing, I've been cheated on multiple times, manipulated, abused, used. I've been treated this way in court by judges. I've been treated by police officers, by my parents, by my brothers and sisters, by people I thought were friends, by bosses, by coworkers, by my wives and girlfriends. Nobody. I mean, like I said, I spent my whole life believing what all the great philosophers teach us, that you gotta put other people first. I spent my whole life doing that. But nobody will do that. If you do that, you will be the only one. You will very rarely meet people that are willing to do that. I've, I, was, I was religious for several years. I went to Christian church. Jesus, the main lesson of Jesus is to put other people first. Nobody does that. Nobody. They do it as long as it's convenient. And when it's not convenient, you're there first, which is most of the time, especially in a capitalist society. So now, what do I mean by the right thing? Um, <clears throat> people that have watched my other videos, you know I'm not religious. Um, I don't focus on the afterlife or the supernatural. I don't know whether it's real or not real. I'm, I just... I don't, I don't see any reason to speculate, basically. It, it, I don't, it does me no good to speculate. I focus on here and now. Uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not religious. I see myself as a philosopher. Uh, and I, so I see Jesus of Nazareth, not as a supernatural messiah or not as a son of God. I see him as a great philosopher or prophet. Uh, I see Confucius as a great philosopher, as a prophet. Um, the Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad, Plato, Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Abraham from the Bible, David, Solomon, the Dalai Lama, and even Will Smith. I see these men as great philosophers throughout human existence. These men have been trying to teach us that the pursuit of materialistic possessions is not the purpose of life. They've been teaching us for thousands of years that people are what matters. They have been teaching us that love, compassion, sympathy, empathy, and harmony are the purpose of life. 5,000 5, years have passed since Abraham wrote the Torah. No. Yes. Yes, Abraham wrote the Torah. Wait. No, not Abraham. Moses. Moses wrote the first five books. Anyways. And the mass... Anyways, the per point is this. Thousands of years have passed, and most people still only focus on living for themselves. I've spent 40 years putting the well-being of everyone else before my own, and I'm talking about not just their physical well-being, I'm talking about emotional well-being. Like, 
I spent 40 years not wanting to, trying my hardest not to make anyone upset, not to hurt anyone's feelings. If, they, if I hurt someone's feelings, I apologize and I tried to change myself. If I offended someone, I apologize and try to change myself. People were beating and abusing me and bullying me and making me feel like garbage. I blamed myself. I never blamed anybody else. I never even looked at them to find a reason because I always just assumed it was me. I spent 40 years putting everyone else's well-being before my own. And what I had to show for that is people will take and 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 take with absolutely no intention of ever giving back to you. As long as you're willing to give for others, they will be willing to take from you. Unfortunately, it will never stop until you stop it. Until you stop giving to them, until you enforce your boundaries. And you don't have to become a taker, but you do have to stop being a person that operates 100% out of love and compassion. You don't have to become an abuser, a manipulator, a user, a bully. But you have to start putting yourself first. You absolutely have to. You absolutely have to. Along the way, you may meet other people who put love, compassion, sympathy, apathy, and harmony first and foremost like you do. And you must remain fully aware of yourself and your behavior so that you don't get sucked into the selfish society so fully that when you meet these people who are like you on the inside, that you become the taker. Because it'll happen. Don't allow it to happen. Don't become a taker. Don't become a bully. Don't become the monster. What they say in Batman, in Dark Knight, you either... You either, uh, what? You either live long enough to see yourself become the monster or you die trying to stop him. I don't know, I don't remember. When you meet other givers, you gotta build trust because it could just be a manipulator pretending to be a giver. You've gotta build trust. You have to verbalize your boundaries to them let them know what your boundaries are and then if they cross those boundaries if they are a giver they're gonna adjust here's the thing if if respecting your boundaries causes them to violate their own boundaries you have two choices you have if you want to decide if you really want this person in your life you're gonna have to compromise your boundaries which I wouldn't recommend not after 37 years of compromising my boundaries I would not recommend compromising your boundaries I would recommend accepting that the two of you are on different paths in life loving each other and letting each other move on that's what I would recommend you might not choose to do that you might choose to compromise your boundaries but you just need to realize what you're in for because once you start compromising your boundaries you never know what's what's gonna happen and if they're a taker they're gonna expect you to continue compromising your boundaries compromise more boundaries they're gonna start disrespecting more of your boundaries when people start disrespecting your boundaries they are not meant to be part of your life meet more givers be the change you want to see in the world Gandhi said that don't expect anyone to ever do the right thing because you will be disappointed very frequently. Don't expect anything from anyone. You do the right thing. You enforce your boundaries. And you exercise self-discipline. So, this is the final word here. Alright? This is the word, this is in the words of the great, great Rukovskis, the writer-directors of The Matrix. Um, two of the greatest writer-directors of, of our time, in my opinion. So, you ask, why do you do this? Why do you do anything? Why do you... Some people, I know when I've been depressed, I, I just can't even find a purpose. Like, I, don't, I don't... Sometimes it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. Sometimes it's hard to make yourself do anything and you have to find a reason and the only reason that matters is because you choose to 
I believe it was The Matrix Reloaded, Part 2. No, it was The Matrix Revolution. When Agent Smith asked Neo, why? Why do you persist? Why do you persist? And Neo said, because I choose to. And that's the only reason that matters. Because you choose to. Why do you do anything? Because you choose to. You have to want it. If you're doing something to live up to somebody else's expectations, you will never succeed because you'll never be happy because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for someone else. No one's ever going to change for you, ever, because they will never succeed if they're not doing it for themselves. So when you compromise your boundaries for someone because you're expecting them to change, they're not. They're not going to do it. The people that are going to change are the people who are already changing. The people that you meet that are already on the path you're on, those are the people you want in your life. You don't want people in your life who you think will eventually get on your path or who say they want to be on your path. You can guide them, you can mentor them, but do not make them a close part of your sphere of influence. So, how, how do you do this? This is another quote from the Great Bukowski's, and this was from The Matrix Part 1. There is no spoon. You have to believe there is no spoon because there isn't. The spoon represents all of your preconceived notions and limitations. They don't exist. All of the insecurities you have about why you can't do this or why you can't do that, all the things that your parents put in your head, all the things your best friends put in your head, your aunts, your uncles, the people that you cared about, the people that raised you when you were a child, all the weaknesses they put in your mind, they're not true. They don't exist. They only exist in here. You've been convinced that you can't. You've been convinced you're weak. You've been convinced you're not good enough, but it's not true. It's not true. No one needs to believe in you but you. Believe in yourself. And when that insecurity starts creeping in, tell it no. Tell it, screw off. I know who I am. I am me. I am Levi Heaton III. I'm an actor and a um, fitness enthusiast and a singer. And people love watching me. People love listening to me sing. And this is who I am. And this is who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Love and compassion and honor and empathy and harmony are the things that are important to me. And when that stuff my parents used to tell me about being a loser and a bum and a punk and being no good and sounding like a dead cat when I sing, when I start, when that stuff starts coming to my head, bullshit. Fuck that. No. No, that's, that's not who I am. That's who those insecure people made me think I was when I was weak and unable to and hadn't learned these things that I learned yet. You are not the sum of your mistakes. I am not the sum of those stupid mistakes that I made doing drugs. I am not the sum of those stupid mistakes I made telling lies. I am not the sum of those stupid mistakes I made getting drunk for 30 days straight, staying drunk for 30 days. I'm not the sum of those stupid mistakes. Those were mistakes. They were learning experience. I've learned from them. I'm the guy that made those mistakes and learned from them and kept learning and kept moving forward and kept building upon those mistakes and has become the guy that I am right now. And that's who you are. You're the person that learned from those mistakes and is continuing to learn. And, and we're going to make more mistakes. We're going to make more mistakes. And we're going to learn from those. And we're going to start enforcing our boundaries. And we're going to start exercising self-discipline. And we're going to be amazing. We're going to be amazing. We're all going to die. That is an inevitable fact. We are all going to die. I don't know about other countries, but in my society now, in the United States, people like to act like the whole purpose of life is to not die. When, when somebody dies or something dies, it's just such a travesty. It is a travesty. It sucks. You miss people when they die. But it's, it's, it's part of life. Part of life is death. That's what happens. You could die to, right now. I could drop dead right now making this video. Um, who was that guy? Uh, Godfrey Gao. Godfrey Gao, Canadian, Chinese-Canadian actor. He was 35 years old, living his dream. He was doing a uh, reality show in China last week. Dropped dead on camera, had a heart attack. 35 years old, living his dream. He doesn't regret anything. He doesn't regret anything. He's dead. 
He was living his dream. He was being the full greatness of himself. And he died. Okay, he died. He's dead. But at least he spent his life being great, pursuing the best version of himself. You need to do that. I need to do that. We're going to die. It's, there's nothing we can do to avoid it. Hiding inside, trying to avoid danger, it's not going to keep you from dying. You're going to die. Trying to avoid scary things, you're going to die no matter what precautions you take. You will die. So be incredible. Be incredible between now and then. You don't know when you're going to die. If you're going to die tonight, be incredible between now and tonight. You might die tomorrow. You might die next week. Be incredible between now and tomorrow, between now and next week. Maybe you'll live to be 100. Be incredible between now and 100. Change the world. That's what I'm doing. That's what you're doing. All right. This is, uh, I hope this motivated you all. Have a great one. Bye.